Good morning from Chicago, and thank you for joining the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities, a virtual event series exploring the role of cities in addressing global challenges. Today, we will look at one of the gravest global challenges of all time, the threat of climate change. Cities are both at the root of the problem and vital to any effective solution to global warming. Last month, world leaders convened in Glasgow for the 26th annual UN-sponsored summit. The jury is still out on whether COP26, which U.S. climate czar John Kerry described as the last best chance to prevent climate change, will in fact succeed. But the global community did come together to make a few big commitments. These include the commitments to reduce methane emissions, protect our forests, and phase down, though importantly not phase out, the use of coal. And countries committed to revise their national greenhouse reduction targets this coming year to make sure they collectively achieve the Paris goals of limiting global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. And yet, for all the progress, there were still many questions that have yet to be answered especially around a global carbon market and exactly on how real financial aid will make its way to the developing nations. Also notably absent from Glasgow was any official recognition of the vital role cities can and must play in tackling the challenge of climate change. The final declaration only mentioned their critical role alongside a long list of other actors. So that is why our program today explores how cities are rising to the challenge of a new climate reality. How are they using technology and innovation to meet the challenges of achieving the Paris goals? And how are they working to realize projects across technology, financing, and regulation? We know cities account for more than 70% of global carbon emissions and 93% of them face significant climate risk. Climate change is a global problem and that yet demands local solutions. Cities are represented as critical actors to guide these local efforts and they do so in concert with national government, the international community, the private sector, and civil society. Already cities bring these actors together at the local level and they can help lead that effort globally as well. For an on-the-ground look at this new climate reality, a panel of U.S. experts will join us to explore the policies and partnerships necessary to achieve a green transition. We'll also hear from Gina McCarthy, the White House National Climate Advisor, about the Biden administration's plans for meeting climate goals while creating jobs and collaborating with cities. Our forum sponsors, Underwriter Laboratory and United Airlines, will share how they are working to advance climate goals. And finally, for an international perspective, we'll hear from mayors and from the International Finance Corporation. This program and our year-round work on global cities is made possible by the generous support of our partners and sponsors, the Pritzker Foundation, our lead sponsors, Abbey and UL, our supporting sponsors, Kirkland and Ellis and United Airlines, and by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Our thanks to them and to each of you for watching and taking the time to be with us today. The Prisca Forum is a partnership with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the Financial Times, and we have been so pleased to host it together since 2015. And that, that is why it is now my pleasure to welcome our co-host, the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times, Peter Spiegel. Peter? Thanks, Evo. Eleven dead in Queens, most of them drowning in their own apartments after a torrential downpour. San Francisco glowing orange, choked by smoke from Northern California wildfires. Houston plunged into darkness for days after its power grid failed, overburdened by one of the coldest snaps on record. Any one of these incidents, taken in isolation, would be a remarkable and historical calamity, disasters that once would have been chalked up to freaks of nature. But all three occurred within 12 months of each other. When the unprecedented becomes routine, it is well past time to sound the alarm. Climate change risks making our proudest cities unlivable. 
And the last year is an indication no policy agreement made in Glasgow last month is going to force action quickly enough and consequently enough to reverse the trend towards extreme weather that has tragically become a regular occurrence worldwide. Perhaps rightly, the at-risk communities that have received the vast majority of attention in the wake of rising global temperatures have been island nations and low-lying coastal areas, which are directly in the path of rising sea levels and strengthening tropical storms. But the high population density, complex transportation systems, and aging infrastructure in some of our most celebrated urban areas makes them uniquely vulnerable to the extreme weather triggered by climate change. They cannot be ignored. It goes without saying that the policy response has been too slow and too reactive. Here in New York City, it was remarkable to me that nearly a decade after Superstorm Sandy filled the subway system with water and rendered the tunnels in, in and out of Manhattan impassable, the city was so unprepared for the remnants of Hurricane Ida. When more than three inches of rain fell in an hour in Central Park in September, we saw starkly how little had been done to mitigate against the torrential rains that are clearly going to be a regular feature of city living here in the Big Apple. Urgent action, then, needs to be taken. But do our cities have the capacity to respond? The climate crisis is just one of several overlapping crises cities here in the U.S. and around the world are grappling with, all of which have challenged our resources and our political will. In recent weeks, we've reminded yet again that the coronavirus pandemic is far from over, putting our overburdened urban health care systems back in the danger zone. Here in the U.S., a national reckoning over racial justice followed by a surge in violent crime in several major cities has set already polarized political extremes against each other in frequently unsettling ways. And our economic recovery continues to be highly uneven, with the most privileged in finance and tech seeing almost unprecedented gains in wealth as inflation saps the spending power of the blue-collar workers that make our cities function and thrive. There are signs of hope. Joe Biden's infrastructure package, which was backed by a handful of Republicans in both the House and Senate, included billions to make the American transportation system more resilient in the face of heavy weather and plowed significant investment into a nationwide network of electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles for public transportation. But even the President Biden himself admits the $1.2 trillion package is not enough to, deal, to tackle the climate challenges of our cities and much of the spending is aimed at middle term rather than the immediate. I heard very little about the plight of our cities coming out of the COP negotiations in Glasgow. Which is why, as I always say, the Prince reform on global cities is so important. It is one of the few places advocates for our cities, mayors, business executives, activists, scholars can come together and highlight the particular risk facing our urban areas, today focusing on these very climate challenges that put so many of our city dwellers in potential danger. I look forward particularly to the mayors who are with us today, including Kostas Bakayanis, the mayor of Athens, who I first met more, almost a decade ago, who is taking truly groundbreaking measures to deal with rising temperatures in one of Europe's southernmost cities. It will take these kinds of innovative ideas, collective action by the private and public sectors, and a sense of urgency to preserve our urban landscapes. Let's try to generate a bit of all that here today. Back to you, Ivo. Thank you, Peter. Now, before we move on, I invite you to follow us and engage throughout the forum on Twitter at underscore Global Cities. And now it's on to today's program. One thing we can say for certain is that the private sector is taking notice of climate concerns. Mentions of net zero on U.S. corporate press releases have risen fivefold in the last two years, and CEOs showed up en masse in Glasgow although with all too many of them arriving in their own private jets. Now, we sat down with United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby to discuss his company's efforts to meet climate commitments. At United, focusing on real solutions, uh, sustainable fuels, electric aircraft, and carbon sequestration is really how we're trying not only to make a difference at United, but also to change the conversation so that the whole globe can find real solutions to make a real difference uh, and defeat what is the biggest challenge that faces our generation. To watch the full interview with Scott Kirby, visit globalcitiesforum.org or follow the link below in the YouTube description. We know that participation from the private sector and from large companies like United Airlines is not only critical, but 
essential to meet the climate challenge. And so was innovation in green space. And yet, many great ideas struggle to get implemented, whether because they lack financial viability or face red tape. Our first panel today, moderated by Financial Times' Patrick Temple West, will discuss the reality of achieving climate goals at the local level. And it features Stonely Baptiste Blue, who is a founding partner of Urban Us, Daniela Levine Cava, mayor of Miami Dade, and Stacy Swan, the CEO and founding partner of Climate Finance Advisors. Over to you, Patrick. Thanks, Evo. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with Mayor Daniela, Stacy, and Stonely. Let's jump right into it. Uh, mayor Daniela, Miami Dade County is often cited as a place where climate impacts will be felt first and fastest. How has the county felt the impacts of the climate crisis already? Are there any unexpected or secondary impacts, in particular those related to rising sea levels, that the county is already facing? Thanks so much, Patrick. We are truly the canary in the coal mine and the most assets at risk from sea level rise. So we've been working on this for several years and uh, recently released our comprehensive sea level rise strategy uh, so it includes five very important strategies. We're expanding our blue ways and our green ways. We're creating blue and green neighborhoods. Uh, we're building on the high ground along our transit corridors, and we're raising the land artificially, building on fill. Finally, we're building on stilts. So we're doing everything possible to accommodate. As far as secondary results, we do have something called king tides or sunny day flooding. And these are lasting longer. So we're experiencing, for example, November 3rd through 9th, uh, the longest uh, yet. We had a, a basically seven days of sunny day flooding. So you heard some of the challenges, some of the risks that Miami-Dade is facing there. If worldwide startups are tackling this climate crisis. There's uh, some of the numbers thrown around, 60 billion thrown into the industry. What's the role of urban tech and early stage seed capital in funding climate solutions for cities like Miami? What does your startup selection framework look like? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. And, uh, and thank, thank you, Mayor, for um, really the, the leadership I think Miami shows. And um, I think it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, our firm wouldn't exist if we hadn't, in its form, if we hadn't started in Miami. Uh, really being at the forefront even eight years ago uh, of seeing the early impacts of climate change on uh, urban infrastructure. Uh, it was a huge inspiration uh, for us to uh, be part of the solution to get ahead of the, to get ahead of the problems. Um, you know, I think the, re the role that urban tech and, and early stage seed capital plays is to um, shorten the gap uh, in a sense uh, of of um, sort of idealized solutions and and realizable and scalable solutions um, that that's not a role that local government can play um, and so uh, I think we recognized very early on that um, some of the most interesting ideas and pathways to scale were going to come from uh, urban tech startups and they need capital to, to get off the ground. And we decided to, to play our role there. Um, and, you know, again, the, 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 there's a the spectrum of, of solutions uh, on, on everyone's wish list. And uh, a, a big part of, of, of the, that spectrum are sort of um, long-term sort of scientific breakthrough type of solutions, but there, there are also, uh, uh, you know, tons and tons of, uh, realizable market ready solutions that um, really just need the right teams to come around them and the right and resources to get off the ground. Um, and these are things that cities can procure, but more often than not, they're actually just better, better options for how people live, work and get around cities. And so venture um, historically has have, had a great track record with consumer facing um, and business facing solutions. Um, not such a great track record with government facing solutions. That continues to be a friction point um, because of procurement and regulations and, and for good reasons. Um, but, you know, eight years in and looking at our portfolio and the scale we've reached and the impact we've already had um, on things like energy efficiency and buildings 
um, infrastructure and um, new solutions for more uh, climate friendly transportation. Uh, there are a lot of things that um, uh, a lot of ways that the private, you know, private facing like consumer and business facing solutions can help cities close the gap on carbon footprint and uh, climate readiness. And and it's an exciting it's an exciting time to be looking at this because there's uh, quite a fervor and and enthused level of enthused enthusiasm that's been reached uh, in the venture side of the world around climate. Um, so so it's exciting to see the capital flowing in and the ideas being generated, the teams being put together, and, uh, and now starting to see some really interesting collaborations with cities. Hello, Stacey. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how investment decisions have changed over the last decade because of climate risk and, and opportunities? Is there a noticeable trend of non-climate related decision makers starting now to show concern for and interest in climate risk management? Have you started to see attempts at standardizing reporting or, or progress reporting. Um, so thanks, Patrick, and, and really lovely to be here with the mayor and Stoneley and um, to talk about such an important set of issues. Um, so I'll answer your first question and, and hopefully get to your second one. There has been a market shift in the last decade in terms of investor awareness um, that climate related issues are financial issues and because they're financial issues, they have to have different uh, approaches to uh, investing around them. Um, and that's across the spectrum of different types of investors from major infrastructure investors and pension funds, all the way down to the venture capitalist um, investors and the private equity funds that would invest in kind of the exciting work that Stoneley and his team might be doing. Um, and, and it's really been kind of um, really market and how kind of fast that uh, that transformation in terms of level of awareness has happened. And I would say it's really been in the last three to four years that we've seen that, um, not necessarily 10 years ago. Um, used to be that people thought about investing in climate and, and ESG related issues as uh, potentially kind of part of their, you know, the group, their do good part of their uh, portfolio. But today, um, particularly uh, because of the level of awareness that climate poses a financial risk to returns, um, to asset values, um, to revenue streams, and to costs, um, that this has become quite uh, uh, high in, in, um, in terms of kind of mainstream awareness in the financial sector. Um, a couple of things have driven that. One uh, about, uh, well, in Paris, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures was launched. Uh, you mentioned the second question was about reporting and disclosures. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but but that TCFD engagement really did start to put in the in the kind of awareness um, uh, space of investors. Oh, I actually might have a climate related financial risk. Um, and then, kind of sub subsequently, but also kind of continually, investors have started to experience climate related financial risks partly because we've locked in enough warming and the impacts are starting to become really apparent. As the mayor said, uh, you know, six days of sunny day flooding is a lot different than it probably was 10 years ago. Um, even by that data point, you know, things are changing and investors are kind of aware that it's changing and has potential financial implications. Um, in terms of kind of what they're doing about it, um, I would say that there is a lot of focus on the reporting and the disclosure side, and, and that's for good reason. But I, I think um, while awareness is high, understanding is still beginning to kind of uh, become sophisticated. And you can't actually report and disclose on something you haven't gotten your hands around. So we're kind of in the middle of that process where investors of all different types, again, the pension funds who invest in, you know, longer term assets with predictable returns to the private equity folks who are really looking for kind of really big returns and taking big risks with their money and everyone in between, they're all just starting to get their hands around what climate related financial risks means for their investment process, for their investment return expectations, and for how they're gonna pull together a positive uh, climate portfolio. Um, and that is all kind of good news um, because that means that the system is starting to change. I don't think we're anywhere near kind of uh, perfect there, uh, but awareness is high, understanding is just beginning. And uh, I think you're going to start to see this kind of cascade um, and continue to cascade kind of as, uh, as, as kind of time goes on. And that's what we hear from the banks and investment managers as well. That the interest is there but the learning curve is, is still in the process. 
Mayor Daniela, you've heard from Stanley and Stacy about sort of the investment that the funds looking to get into the climate resiliency, climate investment space. What policies and partnerships might you be working on with the private sector? How will you be working with the federal government as well and their legislation to improve infrastructure and, and hit some green targets? Yeah, well, we certainly are thrilled about the infrastructure bill that was passed and have the great pleasure to be present in Washington at the bill signing and uh, also uh, spending some time in Washington talking to the different agency heads to make sure that we understand for the energy sector, transportation, housing, resilience, uh, so many uh, broadband, so many opportunities that we have to focus on infrastructure. And we know as well that some of this can be leveraged for the private sector. So we've begun conversations with some of the investment groups that are very savvy on these things to see how we can maximize the impact of the federal dollars. We also have applications in for state dollars. Uh, we've got um, really a good track record drawing down federal dollars. For example, we have more WIFIA low interest loans from the, uh, from the EPA for our water and sewer infrastructure than any other community. We're the, the top recipient of these awards since the program began, and we've used it for a lot of our water and sewer upgrades. It's about $1.1 billion total so far that we've received, and that was before the infrastructure bill. So we're, we're definitely gearing up. And um, uh, Art Basel Week in Miami brought also lots of investors uh, in the, the new economy, the tech economy, and we've had many, many conversations about companies that want to be with us in the solution space and conversations that we can have to showcase how do we deal with these changes. Again, we are at the forefront because we're having these changes earlier than some places and people want to be here. So people, you know, are, for example, I had our county when I was commissioner uh, be clear to disclose on our bond. Uh, applications, the climate risk that we face. Uh, I also spoke in Glasgow with uh, real estate advisors who said the, the proactive work we're doing is helping us to stay ahead of the curve in terms of investment and insurance uh, activity here. So we're doing everything right uh, to, to bring the available dollars and, and private investment to the table so that we can can showcase that we are going to take all the steps outlined in our plan. So you heard some of the efforts that the mayor is, is working on, outreach to the financial sector, disclosures to the financial sector. Can you talk a little bit about public-private partnerships um, and any successful P3 deals, projects that you've worked on, and what some of the challenges are that are associated with these P3 deals? I, I wouldn't take credit for any any of the work our startups do. You know, we're there more like coaches and cheerleaders. Uh, but you know, in observation from the sidelines and um, you know, uh, helping encourage along the way, we, we've definitely tracked some really great um, and, and put some really great um, successes uh, in in Q3 and already in Q4 uh, that that fit in the PPP bucket. Like for example, Uni, which is a uh, a bike storage solution. Um, successfully struck a partnership with uh, Jersey City, um, as well as uh, uh, continuing to make progress with uh, Manhattan, with New York City. Um, they they make uh, bike storage pods that effectively replace a single parking spot um, with um, secured park, bike parking for for ten bikes. Um, and and that and what's often missed in the climate conversation is how important um, in carbon reduction. Uh, changing the modes of of how we do things, and, and, and one of those major things that are carbon emitting are transportation. Um, there's a lot of focus on um, uh, electric vehicles, but um, the actual big needle movers around um, electrification and, and lower carbon transportation is are getting folks to walk, bike, and use public transportation. Um, so Uni's Uni's made a lot of progress there. Um, uh, and another company that's made a ton of continues to work with more and more cities and counties is Circuit, uh, and they provide one of these public transportation modes, small shuttle electric vehicle um, shuttles, 
And uh, again, they, they continue to, to find more and more cities that are looking for solutions to get people out of cars. Um, I think I think it's great that um, you know, be, beyond procuring solutions directly, it's great to see, again, sort of bottom up private solutions that are bridging the gap by creating effectively public infrastructure. Um, Tesla has built this very successful um, uh, wide geography reaching supercharger network. They're in the works now to op open that up to other EV um, cars. And that effectively is a brand new piece of public infrastructure that encourages car uh, EV ownership and the transition to EVs. And maybe there is a role there or there, there was is a role there that government is playing to um, smooth and encourage that um, opening up of, of their platform. But if we can see more things like that, where it, it's working in a, in a microcosm uh, uh, towards, de you know, helping us towards decarbonization, how do we encourage this sort of collaboration? That, that was one of our early insights in Miami. Uh, if we could figure out how to leverage the city's access to relationships to encourage collaboration between private party participants, that, that can actually be more powerful than private partner, explicit private partner partnerships. Um, and, and some of that is like, you know, getting companies to work together in the case of Tesla with other EV manufacturers. And some of it is getting consumers and constituents to it. Uh, um, to adopt the things that already exist. Again, a lot of the um, nut, the bigger, the big nut to crack is is distribution and, and um, actually getting people to use these things that are better for the city, better for the environment. Um, another successful case in our portfolio is Ratio. They make smart water management solutions, and they they've built out a really great um, incentive program in partnership with the governments where their product is popular. Um, this mirrors what Nest has done over the years uh, with their um, energy efficiency solutions. Um, uh, one of the co-founders of, of Nest, actually, uh, Matt Rogers, you know, he's recently uh, published uh, a great piece on, on, on the role that startups play. And, and he really drives the point home that is the crux of, of how we think about investing, which is people want to do the right thing, but they only do the right thing when uh, they're more likely to do the right thing when it's easier, less expensive. There's, there's some ROI in it beyond just doing the right thing. And if you could create this sort of user centric approach to finding solutions that can be easily adopted and can beat out the sort of less efficient, less environmentally friendly existing option sets, like that can be the best um, uh, unlock to, to these things that we're trying to solve. And, and again, the, the, the cities and government um, don't have to be the purchaser, but they have all of these insights and these relationships that can help find those optimal um, injection points of matching relationships, sharing insights to help get more things out into the world. And that's a great point about the Tesla opening up its charging stations. Uh, an announcement that I don't think got as much attention as it should have for their surprising corporate being magnanimous on that front. Um, Stacey, a similar question to you. Um, Climate-focused financiers, do you see them coming forward, getting involved in P3s? How are innovative P3s being developed, approached, and the climate change conversation? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I think you're going to start to see this get baked into a number of different public-private partnerships. I'll start with just infrastructure, and, and the mayor mentioned this, but, um, you know, we have, um, in the United States, I think we are kind of rated at a D for our infrastructure, um, and we have a lot of capability um, to figure out how to build infrastructure for the future uh, that that is going to come for us, um, in particular, kind of on the physical side of climate risk. And there's a lot of um, investors who are interested in funding those uh, types of public-private partnerships um, for climate-resilient infrastructure. And and you could start with the climate side and 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 talk about the resilience there. But there's also kind of quite a number of uh, investors interested in the resilience of communities. And this goes to kind of urban planning and the urban kind of question about the role of cities in helping to reduce, um, you know, our carbon emissions and be more sustainable places for people to live overall. Um, but back to the kind of investors, absolutely. Um, and in particular with the rise of um, uh, publicly available uh, programs, incentives, funding mechanisms, uh, tax credits, loan guarantees, all that are really by their nature meant to catalyze investment faster than it would otherwise happen if the market were left to do it on its own because there's a public private nature to it, because there's a public good nature to it, um, all of those kind of public dollars 
you know, are really meant to be kind of doing a couple of things. They're meant to be investing in the communities and building, you know, the infrastructure when it comes to PPPs related to infrastructure, but also doing so with the public good in mind. And so resilience is squarely in line with that. Um, I will also say uh, one of the things that's kind of led to this acceleration and awareness, even if understanding is still lagging, has been the, the, the fact that all the credit rating agencies have now built into their uh, their approach to understanding credit and, and uh, risk of counterparties. Um, they've built in climate related risk capacity. Um, most of them have climate risk teams um, and you're starting to see climate related issues show up in bond spreads, particularly for sovereign bonds, but some municipal bonds too. Um, and municipal bonds fund infrastructure. Um, I, it's not too uh, much of a stretch to think that those credit rating agencies, if they're to give a rating on an infrastructure project that's a PPP, could also, have, because they have the capability to do it, could also kind of move that assessment into the assessment of an infrastructure project. So it has financial implications um, on the kind of risk side. I'll also say that in about a year ago, the IMF put out a report that was trying to look at the other side of the coin. Um, are entities that build in resilience plans getting a benefit when they're getting rated? And they found, of course, the IMF kind of works globally, but the IMF found that yes, for countries um, that have resilience plans in place, their sovereign bond ratings uh, were not as uh, severely affected um, as their kind of peers who might have a lot of similar climate risks, but weren't doing anything about it. So the planning is important and the planning may have potentially real finan financial implications. That's really interesting as a uh, journalist who started his career in covering munis. I, I know the power that that market can bring, and it's not a um, sort of glamorous Tesla-like market, but um, one that can really deliver for cities like Miami and cities in states uh, across the country. Um, Stacey, I'd like to stick with you for a second on... Um, Regulations. I mean, Stoney was talking a little bit about the the tilt, the encouragement, the um, um, the way that finance can be encouraged into these investments. But regulation, I mean, sort of the stick approach. To this has a role to play as well. Are there regulations that you're keeping an eye on that are necessary to ensure that finance is is going into the right type of product services that are better for the climate? So uh, I mentioned CCFD earlier, and um, one of the things that's kind of followed since CCFD was launched in 2015, and they, they issued their report in 2017, have been in that a number of jurisdictions have started putting in place different types of disclosure rules. Um, the European Union has an uh, ESG-related disclosure regulation that was passed in 2020. Um, the UK has uh, disclosure requirements for financial institutions and insurers. Um, and in different parts of the world, China even have, you know, different types of regulation or regulatory kind of uh, triggers in their system that can that do kind of incentivize um, the right outcomes when it comes to climate related investment. Um, so this regulatory space is moving. It's it's country by country and jurisdiction by jurisdiction um, here in the United States. Um, we don't have mandatory disclosures at the moment. Um, the SEC, however, is looking at um, climate disclosure requirements for public companies, and they're, they're doing it in a really serious way. Um, in September of 2021, they issued a sample letter, um, and the sample letter kind of said, went something like this, hey, kind of uh, regulated entity under the SEC, we notice your corporate social responsibility report talks about climate change a lot, but your 10Ks don't. Can you tell us what the discrepancy is? And then it goes on to kind of list some very, very specific questions that are well in line with a, a TCFD-like disclosure framework. Um, and it was a sample letter put on their website. Um, I thought it was quite signaling to the market. Um, they're really taking this seriously. If you ask kind of a, a number of people in the financial community, there may be some climate disclosure requirements on the horizon for SEC regulated entities. Um, but there are of course a whole bunch of other financial regulators uh, that can help move the markets um, that are equally important uh, depending on whether they're regulating kind of the housing mortgage market or whether they're regulating um, you know, commodities or, or other types of financial transactions um, that all can play a role. Um, I think that investors are kind of sufficiently aware and are expecting this, um, most of them, 
so this is where we're seeing a lot of the scrambling today on raising um, the level of understanding and, and investors really trying to get their hands on how do I kind of identify, assess, understand climate related financial risks? How do I bake it into what I do? Because not every investor invests the same way. Some of them have different you know, longer horizons. Some of them have different return profiles. How does it fit for the way I invest? And then, oh, what does that mean from a strategy perspective on how I manage this? Does it mean I, my portfolio shifts? Does it mean I'm looking for different types of investments? Um, this is, and one last thing I'll say is that this is also happening at the same time that a number of investors are trying to find uh, more ESG pipeline um, and climate positive pipeline. So these things are all kind of moving together all at once. From one perspective, as someone who's been working on this issue for more than two decades, I find it quite exciting. I think it's really uh, important um, and hopefully kind of the momentum on all fronts, uh, the financial policy and that kind of practice all move kind of quickly. Well, thank you, Stacey, for mentioning the SEC action. That's probably the biggest part of my portfolio right now. And we will see what they propose, uh, hopefully, at the beginning of the new year. Um, Mayor Daniela, I wanted to pivot back to you on the climate impacts and how they affect communities differently, because climate change can exacerbate inequalities. Um, lower income communities can be more particularly affected by climate change than some of the wealthier areas. How can cities ensure that innovation leads to environmental equity, uh, that, that these climate change concerns, climate change impacts are not detrimentally affecting those in lower income communities? We have actually coined the phrase climate gentrification here, and uh, many are seeing that. I mentioned earlier about building on higher ground. We have seen investors buy up properties in poorer neighborhoods, displacing people, uh, very aggressively displacing people with the understanding that those properties will gain in value and stay higher in value as, as floods are, are increasing and uh, lower lying areas are less desirable. So uh, that's just one aspect of it. Also to make sure that uh, we are creating pipelines for good jobs uh, in this new tech economy, uh, and that includes, we, we hope, resilience tech and equity tech. So we're talking a lot about pipeline jobs. Uh, SoftBank has invested over $350 million in startups having to do with our area. Just one example, they're very dedicated to the proposition of building equitably and many others of the investors. Actually, you might want to check out the Ready Scorecard, R-E-D-I scorecard.org. Uh, put together by one of our local um, activist nonprofit groups focusing on that area as well. Uh, it's not so much directly tied to uh, sea level rise and climate change, but it's all one because that is our reality. And as we still grow and are the epicenter of the new tech revolution, uh, we want to be sure that it, it incorporates the resilience agenda and the equity uh, agenda as well. So that is a centerpiece of my uh, administration. We're going to be launching any kind of development strategy that will showcase uh, all of that. And we're working with these uh, investors to, to ask that they live like they live here and that while they're um, enjoying the lifestyle, that they're also investing in helping us to be the best in idea generation for the future. That's great. Thank you, Mayor Daniela. And I didn't know that about the soft bank. That's uh, that's a pretty interesting uh, investment there. Um, so I'll leave the last question for, for you. Uh, Glasgow COP26 wrapped up last month. Strong presence at COP26 from banks, insurance companies, pension funds, private equity. There didn't seem to be much representation from venture capitalists. How can VCs show their value in the urban climate space and ensure that those voices are not being lost in the climate conversation to some of the major players that, that really um, put their stamp on this, this space at, at COP26. Yeah, I mean, again, v VCs, uh, uh, our role is, uh, it, it is really on the sidelines, um, finding the best um, teams and supporting them and I think if you look for startup representation 
Um, in Glasgow, you'll find a few, you know, a little bit more representation of, of the, the ecosystem from that perspective and that from that lens. And I, I prefer it that way, right? Like VCs, our role is not to um, not to be central planners um, uh, to the degree that we can't avoid sort of picking the the the, the uh, or helping to seed the industry leaders of, of 10, 20 years from now. Um, really, the stars of the show are, are the startups and they have the the ideas and, and um, they, they're showing up and what they're looking for are the pledges that are being made because pledges do matter. Uh, pledges indicate um, interest in allocating dollars and that indicates potential customers. Um, and one of those pledges, for example, like just more and more pledges towards carbon free energy, for example, um, that enables startups in our portfolio um, like uh, uh, Gradient, which is sort of an easier to install um, uh, heat pump based HVAC and, um, and solutions like uh, Flare, which is sort of temperature control, um, lowering GHG emissions in buildings and, and, and homes. And, and, you know, those are the folks that are going to show up in Glasgow and look for where are the regions that are um, truly making, um, uh, you know, real stances on uh, uh, encouraging the adoption of those types of technologies. Um, and, you know, I think the other uh, Im important thing here is like, there, there's a role that um, that the VCs are certainly paying attention, um, even if they're not physically present, because there's a role that the decisions around infrastructure um, plays. And again, changing the terrain of what solutions will win, but also encouraging the uh, most climate positive solutions. Um, it, for example, bike lanes um, verifiably encourage more bike and micro mobility usage. And that trickles back to how much dollars are going to be more further allocated into uh, e-bike and micro mobility vehicle innovation. Um, things like roundabouts and the way that roads are designed are going to encourage or discourage um, things like electric vehicles and uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely paying attention and we're, we're present um, by proxy. Uh, but but the, the goal for us is to figure out, um, I think an earlier question was like, what, what, are, what is our model for Deciding where to put our capital. How do we how do we decide what a, what a good investment might be from the stage that we're investing in, which is high risk? We really do need to see pathways to very large returns and rewards. And when Urban US started um, eight years ago in Miami, we actually started as a public benefit corporation, which for us meant we were going to figure out the best business model for playing the role that we wanted to play in early stage innovation. And it turns out venture, um, even if at first bluff it doesn't, at first glance it doesn't seem to align well with with you know urban innovation and uh, climate climate technology, it's very aligned because the incentive of the business model is to see things that scale, uh, that have massive scale and that have success in the market. And so we're looking for um, for those solutions that um, have great teams behind them, proven technology and have clear pathways from a regulatory and a directional infrastructure perspective. Um, so, so, you know, the COP uh, meetings matter a lot and, and we're definitely there in spirit. A lot of people would, would make the case that uh, time better spent and Gwen Henning in Glasgow is better spent time resources on the ground with, uh, with portfolio companies. Stoneling, Stacy, and Mirjana, uh, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Hope it was valuable for you as well. And back to you, Eva. Thank you, Patrick, and to our speakers for what was a fascinating discussion. Now, we know that technology and partnerships and financing are critical to achieving a just green transition. So for a look at the Biden administration's efforts to help people while taking the lead on tackling climate goals, please welcome National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be joining you to talk about the climate challenges that we have to face together as well as all the opportunities that we can seize together as we act on climate change in the US and across the globe. We can build a better future if we start integrating climate into all of our decision-making. You know, President Biden has embraced the urgency of this moment and made tackling the climate crisis a central priority across his administration. And for the first time, we have a national climate task force that brings together cabinet level, level leaders across the federal government who are working together to mobilize a whole of government response. So we don't just tackle the climate crisis, but we do it in a way that will create millions of good paying union jobs and deliver 
clean air, clean water, and environmental justice, and build a more equitable and resilient world. Look, that's how we're going to build a better future together. It has to be one that's safer, healthier, and more resilient. You know, and I know that it's time to act on climate, but let's do it with hopeful determination, a hopeful determination that keeps communities safe from climate impacts with smart, resilient infrastructure and efficient buildings and yes, renewable energy. You know, it's exciting that our country just took a big leap forward with the president signing of the bipartisan infrastructure law. The investments will be transformative for cities and communities all across the United States. We're going to be modernizing our transportation sector with upgrades in our roads and bridges, as well as our largest ever investment in public transit and passenger rail, along with building out a national network of 500,000 EV chargers so we can grab and build the electric cars of the future. We're going to be delivering clean water to every city by eliminating those lead pipes and cleaning up PFAS chemicals that are plaguing so many of our communities. And we'll be investing thousands of miles of new transmission lines so that everyone can have access to clean and affordable electricity, whether you live in a city or, or a rural community, because we're gonna make President Biden's 100% clean energy by 2035, not just a nice goal, but an actual done deal. And to help us get the implementation right, President Biden has brought on board Mitch Landrieu, a former mayor of New Orleans and Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana that many of you may know. Mitch is a leader and he's going to be managing our White House Task Force on Infrastructure Implementation in close coordination with all of you, with states, local, tribal, and territorial governments to advance our shared priorities. And we'll be focusing every step of the way on climate resilience. That means infrastructure has to be built to withstand climate impacts with guidance and real-time data that factors in local climate projections before they start to build. And by in incentivizing the use of climate smart materials that are more resilient and lower carbon. Thankfully, the bipartisan infrastructure law includes $50 billion specifically for resilience investments. And that's a game changer, especially for communities on the front lines of this climate crisis. You know the ones, they're facing droughts and wildfires, extreme heat, floods, coastal threats like sea level rise, hurricanes and tornadoes. But we're also harnessing existing resources across federal agencies to empower local resilience efforts. FEMA is delivering billions of dollars in grants through its Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Program. We call it a BRIC program to help communities proactively protect against the next disaster or superstorm. And we're adding flexibility to longstanding programs like LIHE, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and that's going to help us recognize the need for more air conditioning units in areas that are totally unprepared for the kind of heat waves they're now facing. And we're expanding climate information and decision tools. That's so that every community can better plan and better respond. Look at the wildfire smoke maps that we're providing now. That helps people understand where that dirty air is going so they can begin to protect themselves. Or our updated flood protection standards or the citizen science that we're getting on urban heat islands. All of these are information tools that are going to make our future safer, healthier, and brighter. And we're gonna keep our promise to communities most in need by delivering at least 40% of these benefits to disadvantaged communities that are so desperately in need of on the ground visible benefits so they can be hopeful too. Yes, we have, are excited about all the progress so far, but we need to do so much more if we actually want to meet the urgency of this moment and seize the opportunities of climate action. That's why President Biden's Build Back Better Act 
which recently passed in the House and is now moving through the Senate, is just so very critical because it's going to put us on a decisive path to acquire our national climate goals, to meet them and even exceed them, because it's going to give us the ability to share lessons learned so we can accelerate the work that so many cities are already providing leadership on, like deploying clean energy, making more efficient and healthy buildings, and cleaning up pollution in overburdened communities. And it's going to advance new financing strategies with a new clean energy and sustainability accelerator. And it'll make historic investments in things like natural climate solutions, like coastal restoration and forestry. And let's not forget about the new exciting civilian climate core that will put a diverse new workforce of young people to work helping with restoration and conservation efforts and community level projects and other opportunities moving forward that will build skill sets for them that will allow them to access good paying union jobs. And rest assured that as we take these transformative steps at home, we're also going to work hard to strengthen global partnerships. And our local leaders are certainly playing a major role in that effort. You know, I saw many of you at COP26 and you were U.S. Mayor, mayors leading by example, making new commitments, rallying other global cities around a net zero future. This kind of bottom-up collaboration and leadership is what has kept the U.S. charging forward together with our climate. And now we're moving full speed ahead. We're excited to be partnering with you during this decisive de decade. Let's keep moving forward together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina, for joining us today and for giving us an insight into what the Biden administration is doing to tackle this big problem. Now, our sponsors, Underwriter Laboratories, works here in the US and around the world to help companies and municipalities achieve their climate commitments through renewable energy solutions, setting sustainable standards, and for carbon management and reporting service. To learn more about UL's work, visit globalcitiesforum.org or the link in your YouTube description. I want to thank again our sponsors and to all of you who are joining us today. To close out our program, we join Simon Mundy of the Financial Times, who is in conversation with Mayor Bakayanis of Athens, Lord Mayor Cap of Melbourne, and the IFC's global head of climate business, Vivek Patak. They'll take an international look at achieving climate commitments through green infrastructure projects. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, Ivo, and welcome everyone. This has been a big year for the conversation around climate change. We've had the extraordinary and, and controversial and high profile COP26 conference. We've unfortunately had some very severe impacts of climate change seen all over the world. And this has really highlighted the need to think much more carefully and achieve much more progress in tackling climate change. And to a very large extent, the way in which we tackle climate change, this will be about how cities tackle climate change. Most of the world's population now live in cities, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in today's discussion. And I'd like to go straight into this with a question to you, Costas. Obviously, Greece is a country that has seen a lot of climate impacts, very vulnerable to forest fires in particular. So for Athens, what, what does climate change mean for Athens now and over the long term future? Well, we have had the terrible summer. It was a real nightmare. Uh, we saw mega fires, which, however, did not happen in a vacuum. They were the direct consequence of prolonged and early heat waves. Uh, this is, shouldn't surprise us. 2020 was actually the hottest year on record in Europe, and 2021 is expected to break this record. Now, as you mentioned, it was a, back, a big year for climate change. We saw what happened in Glasgow, although I should say that many of us were quite disappointed with the results, which I think fell way behind and below expectations. So now I think it's up to cities. 
It's not just that we are in the homes of a big part of the world's population. It's also that cities are responsible for 70% of CO2 emission. And that's what we're doing in Athens. Basically, every and any decision, big, small, big or small, has the climate change at its heart. It could be something as small as the material that we use on sidewalks or the pocket park, or it could be something as big as the investments in our urban lands or our urban regeneration projects. It's very, very clear that we don't have any, li- any time to lose. Thank you so much. Now, Sally, Melbourne, this is a city on the other side of the world from Athens. And of course, so I spent some time um, reporting on, on climate impacts um, and the conversation more broadly around climate change uh, in Australia. Now, the most high profile impacts of climate change in Australia have been in other parts of the country. Um, but clearly every city in the world, certainly including Melbourne, have a lot to think about here. What's your key focus when it comes to climate change in Melbourne? Well, Simon, thank you. We we do feel the impacts of climate change enormously here in Melbourne as one of the world's most livable cities. We are now experiencing more days over 35 degrees, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we are having uh, 40% lower rainfall in 2019, and yet the year before we had a one in 1,000 year Uh, storm event uh, that caused flooding in the city. We're seeing enormous variability that puts a lot of strain on our city. And we are regarded for events, for example, here in Melbourne. And each year, uh, the operation of the uh, Grand Slam Tennis Australian Open gets more difficult with interruptions due to extreme heat, for example. So for us, this has been an ongoing issue, uh, and I take Costa's point. We've also suffered um, severely from bushfires. In fact, we had the worst air pollution in the world in January last year as a result of smoke haze. Uh, So for us, it has been a a focus. Since 2012, our organisation has been carbon neutral. We have declared a climate and biodiversity emergency here in Melbourne to make sure that our policies and our programs and our investments are focused around uh, climate change responses. And we have set some ambitious targets to be across our city powered by 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and zero net emissions by 2040. So a lot of work ahead, uh, but some good ambitions as well. Thanks so much, Sally. So there's two really interesting case studies there of two big and important cities, cities all over the world, Vivek, are having to deal with this extraordinary range of challenges, not only in building their own resilience and strength in terms of dealing with the impact of climate change, but also trying to mitigate their own contribution to climate change in terms of their carbon emissions. Something that I'm very interested in, and we at the FT are very interested in, is the use of technology to deal with these challenges. And it's a, it's a controversial topic, as you know, because there are people who say that we shouldn't focus too much on the potential for new technologies. We should focus on implementing things that we have right now. But in your opinion, what are the things that you're most interested in, in terms of the potential uses of technology in cities to tackle all these different challenges that we've been discussing? Sure. Thanks, Simon. And I come from the camp. Uh, I, I would hope there's not too much debate in the use of technology because I come from the camp where I firmly believe a lot of the solutions that we're talking about are going to come with with advancements in technology. And let's backtrack for a minute. Uh, 15, 18 years ago, when we started doing solar, the costs were high, 26, 28 cents. I remember that when we did our first few deals. Uh, But 15, 18 years down the road, costs have come down in countries like India to less than two cents. How did that happen? Combination of factors and technology played a key role. Solar panel, Technologies went through some radical changes and that improved efficiencies. In addition, we had a bit of, you know, de-risking capital. We took a lot more risks and the whole system scaled up. So that's what made prices come down. And I believe that will happen in technology as well. Now, I'll just share with you a very interesting deal that we did some time ago. It's a company called Appeal. And uh, Appeal makes an organic solvent with which you can coat fresh fruits and vegetables. And that will increase the longevity of these red fruits and vegetables. Why is that important to climate? Agriculture is a major emitter of greenhouse gases. They're the consumer of water. 
And I think between 32 and 35 percent of fresh food produce is wasted today. So if you can increase the longevity effectively, you're going to reduce the carbon emissions through the entire value chain, whether it's logistics, use of water, or direct emissions. That's one example. Another example is we've got a program called Tech Emerge, which is focusing on smart cooling, and we're piloting it in Latin America. Now, Tech Emerge is really going to focus on how do you increase, reduce your carbon footprint when it comes to things like hotels, when it comes to large food and beverage companies. And so that's another example where we're trying to pilot new technologies that are coming up there. A third example I'll share with you is a very boring subject for most people, but I'm sure the two mayors on the line will appreciate it, is cement. You know, as we're going to ask cities expand, they're going to use more construction materials. And what we've seen is that if you were to use run-of-the-mill approaches, you can probably reduce emissions by 15, maximum 20%. But if you want to really make that radical shift to 40, 50% reduction in emissions, it's going to come from new technologies. And last but not least, which I, I'm sure the two mayors would want to know is, we've developed an internal tool called Edge, which is for constructing green buildings and which is for retrofitting green buildings. And that also uses technology. It's an online tool. Anyone can access it. It's a public good. So that is, again, a good example of how technology can be used to socialize and democratize some of these innovations that are happening. Thanks so much, Vivek. That's fascinating stuff. Um, Kostas, coming back to you, I want to focus in particular on an issue that I know you've been thinking a lot about in Athens, which is heat. Now, this is something, if anyone's ever seen the charts of excess deaths um, in Europe, for example, but it's the same in other parts of the world, when you have an exceptionally hot summer, the death rate goes up very dramatically. It's largely people who are older, um, people who have existing health conditions, people die as a result of heat. And so it's, it's very, very important. And of course, there are places in the world, you know, you can think of Pakistan, for example, countries that have even more severe heat challenges than Greece. Um, but Greece does have this issue. And Athens, I believe, is the first European city to have a chief heat officer. So this is something you've been looking at closely, and in particular, I think, looking to exploit technology in tackling this problem. Can you tell us a bit about your approach well, on that? As you said, heat is a silent killer. Only in Greece, we lose, on average, 200 people every year because of heat. Now, you realize that in Greece, talking to Greeks about heat is like talking to fish about the water. So the first key challenge for us is to communicate on the real and present danger of heat waves. So practically, as you said, we appointed uh, the first chief heat officer in Europe. We are trying our best and we are very proud and I'm very proud to report that next summer, all heat waves will be named and categorized for the first time. For us, it's a question of public health. There are many valuable experiences that we have drawn from the pandemic. We should use and utilize these experiences, these lessons learned when it comes to uh, fighting climate crisis. And of course, uh, technology and innovation is key. And it has to do with uh, the materials that we use, which I mentioned earlier, which is quite concrete, or it could be something that's actually uh, rather interesting, for example, the fact that we have a new project where we have mapped out the heat map of the city and we are able to intervene where we are most at pain. And when I talk about pain, I'm actually not using this word um, out of, you know, it's not a coincidence that I use this word, because we now know very, very well that climate change is directly correlated to social, social economic challenges. And if we want to have cities that are equitable, that are fair, that have opportunities for all, we have to be very, very careful both about our green transition and about our social transition, which has to happen at the same time. Thank you so much, Costas. So, Sally, in Melbourne, of course, you've been finding opportunities to deploy technology also. And I understand that in the field of, of batteries, um, there, are, there are certain things you've been pursuing there in terms of making the most of the opportunities to to make the energy consumption more efficient and potentially greener? Simon, we are. And uh, to build on Costa's point earlier, 
here in the city of Melbourne, if we put transport to one side, our biggest emissions, 60%, come from existing commercial buildings. So a sense of how uh, not only do we need to overcome that embedded energy, but how do we actually address ongoing energy use in existing buildings? We are launching into a community scale batteries here in Melbourne as an independent distributed network uh, that can assist with the storage of renewable energy. It will also promote the generation of renewable energy through the city. And uh, it also gives our small businesses and our residents the opportunity to participate in using more renewable energy. 84% of our residents live in high rise with virtually no opportunity uh, to be involved uh, actively in uh, generating and using renewable energy. And it's the same for many of our small businesses. This will be the first of its kind in Australia. And we're very focused as well on making sure that this project is replicable and scalable so that it can be used across other uh, cities in our state and across Australia. Uh, we do see that uh, by uh, starting this pilot early next year, we're going to learn a lot as well. So we're looking at the research uh, outcomes. We're looking at training. We are embracing green technology uh, and we want this to be uh, manifest itself in new green jobs. Um, we're very much looking for that transition away from fossil fuel, particularly coal generated power here in Australia, and we need to take people along with us, uh, that sense of equity, but also to reduce fear by making sure that we're generating jobs from renewable energy as we move forward. So our Power Melbourne initiative, which is all about those community uh, grid, uh, community scale batteries and grid across our city, uh, we think will really rally interest in learning from and jobs uh, in battery storage for renewable energy. It's super interesting. And I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear the perspective of these two mayors from two developed world cities and Vivek to, to consider how far there are commonalities and differences. Of course, there are many differences between the sort of challenges that um, cities have like Athens and Melbourne, cities in, in Europe and Australasia and North America and cities in countries that the IFC focuses on in developing countries. How far do you think there are commonalities? What are the key differences in terms of the way that cities address these challenges? And how far is the IFC when it engages in these developing countries? How far is it seeing opportunities to engage in that very focused way, looking at the challenges of cities specifically? So Simon, I don't know if you saw when uh, uh, Sally was talking, I was nodding my head vigorously because what immediately came to my mind is that we would love to learn from this example in Melbourne, when you're, the way you're using battery technologies and see whether we can adapt it or replicate it with some of our, in some of our client countries with the cities in which we're engaged. And at the same time, I want to offer that we would love to share with both the mayors our edge tool where you can convert some of your existing buildings into green buildings. It's a pretty straightforward tool. I have a habit of simplifying things, so forgive me, it's not as straightforward, but we're doing it in some of the most challenging markets today. So it's been proven. So, so after this, I'd love to connect with you all on this. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's something I've never really focused on. What are the differences? But when I look at a city, I think there are more commonalities than differences because the challenges are the same. Uh, we can say some of the differences may come in access to capital because a city like Athens or Melbourne, I think will have access to a bigger pool of capital than a city like New Delhi or Bangkok or uh, Kampala and Uganda or Rio. So I think that is one of the challenges that a city has because if they're not credit worthy or at, at a sort of with institutional investors, I think they're going to have a challenge attracting the sort of capital that is needed. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, one of the ch common challenges I'm finding is you know, people don't talk a lot about it, but those area of circularity and how we collect waste. Yeah. Now, I was talking to a large city, well, a medium-sized city in Asia, Singapore, and they're very progressive in many fronts. But one of the challenges that they've had is because a lot of their housing is relatively old, the way they recycle waste has become a challenge for them. So I think there are these common areas, and I think that's one thing, honestly, that we need to be doing more of is engaging more with developed countries to see how we can use some of the solutions that have been developed there, and I, I like to use the word adapt rather than replicate. Yeah. 
the last thing I think which is critical is a lot of these things that we're trying to do when we engage with a city in a developed market is it involves some amount of reform. And I'll be very blunt here is sometimes this reform, it's not as easy as putting on a light switch, but there are vested interests there that will be impacted. And I suspect it's very similar in developed countries sometimes. So getting that reform through and helping the mayor or the governor of a city or a governorate understand that there may be a challenge in the beginning to get this reform through. But in the long run, this is going to benefit everybody. It's going to benefit the population. It's going to benefit the government. So it's a win-win. But like with any win-win situation, sometimes there are hurdles that we need to cross. And I think that's really where we are coming up with a lot of challenges in convincing uh, the people in power that this makes sense in the medium to long term. One of the challenges is if your term is three years, by the time the benefits accrue, you may be out of power, I think. So that's one of the challenges we are facing, actually. So this is really one of the big issues, whether you're in a developed country or a developing country at city level or country level, it is true that the key to long-term prosperity is going to be in that transition to a low carbon system, but it's also true that it's going to involve costs and disruption in the short term. And that involves challenges around how to, to cover those costs, how to raise the, the finance that's necessary there. Um, Costas, what's the approach that Athens is taking to this? Clearly, there are going to be all sorts of costs involved in the, in this transition. If we if we even just focus on the transition to a lower carbon city economy, what kind of approaches are you taking to that? And are you finding innovative financial solutions can be helpful in that? Well, I hate to answer with a cliche, but coming from a country that's actually quite experienced in crisis for the past 15 years, we have learned to look at crises as opportunities. Now, I fully, fully agree with what Vivek said earlier. Um, I hear very often, you know, wonderful goal setting. What are we going to do in 2050? What are we going to do in 2060? What are we going to do in, to, in, in to, to 2080 or 2090? Well, I, I have no time and no patience for that. I think the goals that we have to set have to be goals for our own terms and our own lifetimes. Because if we want to be realistic and if we want to be effective. Now, clearly, there are costs involved. Um, according to our analysis, uh, on a national level, it's going to take 2% of our GDP for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, but if you take into account the funds that will be redirected, it's actually less than that. It's around 1% of the GDP. So there are costs, but there are also very, very clearly benefits. Uh, let me give you just one example. Uh, the digital transition, which is directly related to fighting the climate crisis. Uh, we have, for us, uh, the pandemic, especially during the lockdowns, was a catalyst for long overdue reforms. And we changed the relationship between the city and the citizens. And, of course, we gained a lot as a city and our environment gained a lot through this. It's a question, I think, of actually making sure that one has a realistic plan, uh, clever policies, but also knowing that it takes a stomach, uh, it takes insistence and persistence, and nothing is given to any city in the world for free. Thanks so much, Kostas. Um, Sally, turning to you with the, the financing question, so something that we're thinking about a lot and something that's a hotter and hotter topic is the extent to which public and private capital can work together through through whatever sorts of schemes to, to, to really deliver the financial resources that are needed here. What approach are you taking to this in Melbourne in terms of using your your balance sheet as a, as a city administration alongside private sector resources to try and really maximise that impact? Mm. Simon, uh, we uh, really pursue those public private partnerships. We do understand that there are uh, elements of leadership required in delivery, in partnering and in influencing. And so from our perspective, we really take the piloting, we, we take those areas of higher risk uh, on ourselves to develop as, as, as much as we can. I'll give you an example. We set up in 2017 a Melbourne Renewable Energy Program, which at is a power purchasing agreement for uh, wind farm energy, which means we now uh, use 100% renewable electricity here at the city of Melbourne. 
we did all of the pre-work on that model uh, before going out to look for partners. So we de-risked it in that way and we funded that ourselves. When we then went out to the market, we partnered with 10 other organisations across university sector and the private sector. And those 10 partners then came in with us for the funding uh, of the building of the wind farm uh, through the power purchasing agreement. Uh, and that means that as a result of the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project, not only do we have all the bank branches in Melbourne uh, powered by 100% renewable electricity, all of our street lights. Uh, campuses across our universities, uh, but across our municipality, we've taken 5% of emissions out, uh, which is a lovely step, positive step forward in our quest to, to zero net. That was only possible by working with the private sector. Uh, now, as I said, uh, we do work on replicable, scalable models. Uh, that model is being used by 39 other cities across our state and is also being used by Sydney and Adelaide to build uh, those partnerships uh, to uh, reduce emissions. So uh, it is important to understand we have different roles to play uh, at different parts of, of building up those programs. Uh, but if we can be clear on that and really work uh, closely with the private sector, it's amazing what we can achieve. Thanks so much, Sally. Vivek, Something that struck me during my research on climate change responses is when it comes to financing, there's a huge difference in the in the ease and the, the, the general setup for mitigation versus adaptation. So um, just to recap for the audience, so mitigation involves tackling carbon emission em emissions, adaptation involves building resilience and reacting to climate impacts and extreme weather events and so on. So it's relatively, um, relatively easy, not easy, but relatively easy to develop a financing plan to, for example, build a solar power plant. It's much more challenging to develop a financing plan to build resilience against typhoons or to relocate a vulnerable community and so on. What sort of potential do you think there is to develop more sort of innovative mechanisms to really mobilize that funding that really is needed to handle the adaptation side when it comes to cities in particular, but also more broadly. Yeah, so I think you raised a very valid point, Simon, and that's something we struggle with. And I've been in the job for slightly less than a year. And uh, that's the one thing I'm really focused on is how do we attract private capital into adaptation and resilience? So just to explain to people what the challenge is, you know, you have a coastline and you've got 50 hotels on the coast or 30 hotels on the coast, and that coast is eroding. So the government says, well, we need to protect tourism. So we're going to come and figure out a way to avoid that erosion from happening. Now, who pays for that? Then? Will it be all the hotels that are there? That's one way. But if the hotels aren't yet built and the, the government is trying to do something proactively, who's going to pay for it? The private sector is saying, where is the cash flow to repay my loan if I give you a loan? Or where is my return on equity? So this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to break it down into very simple terms. But this is something we are looking at quite seriously. Uh, and one way to really do it is, so we've developed something which we're piloting in the Philippines now, which is a country that's prone to a lot of typhoons. It's called the Building Resilience Index. We're calling it uh, uh, the BRI, the Building Resilience Index. And that will really, building by building, help you to see what do you need to do to make your piece of real estate resilient to natural disasters that may occur based on certain projections and models that have been developed, which are publicly available now. So that's one thing that we're trying to do. And I think we, so that may not be, you cannot protect the whole area, but at least if I was investing in real estate, I would be able to protect the value of my real estate by investing in that area. Now, the one thing that we think will help the whole area of adaptation is going to be carbon markets. Because if you go and do reforestation or reforestation, you may not, there is no sort of cash flow coming if you go and plant 500 square kilometers of forest in Kenya, say. But once carbon markets start to function, and there was a lot of positive movement on carbon markets at COP, I think you can start getting carbon credits for that. So having a reasonably functioning, and note I'm not saying well functioning or a perfectly functioning, you know, that will happen probably after my retirement. But a reasonably well-functioning carbon market, I think is going to help the whole area of adaptation. 
So there are a lot of these kind of things we're looking at. We don't have a solution. Uh, I'm literally under the gun to come up with things. But what we are going to need for this is, uh, and here I reach out to our wealthy donors and philanthropic organizations who may be listening in, is we're going to need two pools of capital. We're going to need capital, which will help us. And we've got units in IFC that do that. We call it the upstream unit, which will help us think of innovative structures and models to make this happen. And then we're going to need some amount of de-risking capital to get the private sector comfortable, you know, when the private sector comes in for the first time into something that's new and untested, they're concerned about it because the shareholders are going to ask them. So something to deal with some of these deals initially, and as we see it's viable, I think they're going to be able to crowd in a lot more from the private sector. So these are the kind of things we're looking at, but it is a huge challenge in our fairness. It's a big challenge, and there's, unfortunately, we're, we're almost at the end of the um discussion but it reminds me of the conversation around blended finance um which is basically this this idea of using public capital to crowd in private capital public sector capital could take the first share of losses um certain people are pushing back against that and they're saying you know that, that, that this could lead to the private sector taking the profits and the public sector the taxpayer being on the hook and i i think separate from our discussion about the merits of, of blended finance. I think that reflects a wider concern among many people that the response to the climate crisis could be along the same lines as what many people see as a not totally fair organization of the global economy, and especially in, uh, in, in the US and Western Europe. Um, over the past, say, 20 or 30 years, where we've seen the incomes of the bottom 50% of the income distribution rather flatlining, uh, and the incomes of the very richest doing much, much, much better. So, Costas, um, we only have time for, for one more, more question, unfortunately, but I, I'd like to throw it to you because this has been such a live issue in Greece over the past 10 or 15 years, the issue of economic justice. Um, and I think a lot of people think there is a risk that our response to the climate crisis economically both at national levels and at the global level may not be on a perfectly just basis so what in your opinion are the key things that we need to achieve um at city level as well as more broadly to make sure that this is a truly just transition and a response to the climate crisis that is truly economically just in the broadest sense well um, tell me about it. Um, this is, you know, the story of our lives in Greece. There were times a few years ago when Athens uh, quite literally reminded many of us of the Weimar Republic. And yet, uh, we are back. We didn't just bounce back, actually. We bounced forward with a newly found sense of optimism and, and self-confidence. And we did this having actually put aside populism, radicalism, and extremism, and extremism and with the quite sober, which is quite surprising by Greek standards, political system. Now, we have to be fair, however. If one co compares the bungled, and this is me being as polite as I can, European response to the financial crisis 10 years ago with the very bold and assertive European response to the pandemic and the equally bold and assertive European response to the climate change, to climate change and the climate crisis, then one can clearly trace that a lot of progress has been made and that at least, talking about Europe, um, bitter lessons have actually been learned. Now, this gives us a lot of optimism for the future. I mean, we were talking earlier about the financial uh, tools that are at our disposal. Now, of course, all cities have to design their own, their own financial tools. Uh, of course, we want to leverage our uh, public sector funds to be able to attract uh, public sector. Uh, blended financing actually sounds pretty good and pretty effective to me. But we're also quite privileged. We're quite privileged that we have the recovery fund, uh, which, which, from which we can draw the necessary funds and monies to move forward. Uh, and establish uh, and, and make our goals. Thank you so much, Costas. And it's such an important topic that actually I would like to throw it to the other two panelists as well. Um, Sally, from your perspective, from the Australian perspective, from the Melbourne perspective, how can we make sure this is a really just transition? Well, Simon, recognising that so many projects that help reduce temperatures or manage stormwater better 
uh, uh, or bring down emissions, they do benefit the entire community. We also recognise that we want to motivate and incentivise the private sector to jump into projects that are going to have those overall benefits uh, for our community by addressing climate change issues. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the impact on individuals by providing support where necessary, particularly if there are costs, for example, that make energy too expensive for our citizens uh, or programs that they're unable to participate in. And we can provide support at that level. But an example of where we're using that blended approach is our urban forest fund, where we pay 50% of projects that are on private properties where they're able to show a public benefit. And we've seen some fantastic proliferation of things like vertical green walls, for example, um, but more recently a new sky farm uh, that's going to add significantly to reducing temperatures. We're learning a lot from what can be grown uh, on top of uh, a big car park. They will make some profit along the way, but they're also adding to those benefits by educating uh, our local citizens. And it's those sorts of projects that will really see us take great strides forward. Thanks so much, Sally. And we, we just have time to go to Vivek for, for the last word on, on climate justice. And it's important because your work is focused on the developing world, which is where most people live. And we've seen so many problematic issues to do with, um, for, for example, the missed prom promise to provide $100 billion a year in, in climate finance to the developing world. There are so many problematic issues here. How can we make sure that this is a just transition in particular for developing countries where most people in the world live? Yeah, thanks, Simon. So this is something really close to my heart. So I can probably talk for a couple of hours, but I'll try to do it in a couple of minutes. So Australia, India, Indonesia, South Africa, hugely dependent on coal. If you were to shut down coal tomorrow, tens if not hundreds of millions of people at the bottom of the pyramid will be rendered jobless. Forget the entire ecosystem on transport. And, you know, there's a whole ecosystem around fossil fuels today. So when we are talking about how do we wean ourselves away from fossil fuels, we cannot just look at shutting down a coal-fired power plant or shutting down a mine. We have to have to see what are we going to do to the entire ecosystem that's going to be impacted. The Indian railways, the largest revenue generator, I believe, is coal. So if you were to remove coal from the equation, how are these transport companies going to meet, make their ends meet? How are these people? So as you can see, I'm really, so we have to focus on that. Now, the way out is this reminds me of the digital or the tech revolution that started 30 years ago, is our companies, countries, sorry, and populations and people who got left out because they were not skilled enough to get jobs in the new global economy, which was linked to digital and tech. So similarly, what I'm saying here is we need to figure out, I don't have the answers today. What will a decarbonized world look like? What are the skills that we need to be providing to the youth of today so that they can get relevant jobs tomorrow? And how do we reach skilled people who are going to lose, jo lose jobs in carbon heavy emitting industries today so that they remain employed? So it's about skilling and it's about really understanding the political economy and who is going to be impacted and making sure they're going to be taken care of. Thank you so much, Vivek. And thank you also to Costas and Sally for what's been a Terrific discussion. I'm not going to try and summarize it. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, so thank you to all of you. Thank you everyone for watching and back to you, Evo, in the studio. One meeting alone won't succeed in tackling the global scourge of climate change. And COP26 proved just that. But what the summit did do was bring together world leaders across different levels of government and different sectors. And together, they made real commitments that wouldn't have been made otherwise. But the proof will be in the actions that are taken now, after the COP concluded, in the funds that are unlocked, the projects that are realized, the sustainable energy plants that are built, the forests that are saved, and yes, even the interim reports that are submitted. It will take broad, sweeping reforms and new financing vehicles the collective action of youth, and the small changes in our everyday lives each of us can and should make. From the international to the national, and from the local to the individual, it will take everything we have, every one of us, to change the tide and avoid the worst that a warming planet promises to offer.
Thank you to today's speakers and moderators, to our sponsors, and to everyone who spent the last hour with us. Visit globalcitiesforum.org for more information, and be sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter to receive regular updates. We know you have a lot of choices for where you engage, especially in this digital age, and therefore we're grateful for your support, which makes our work possible. For now, stay safe, stay cool, and we hope to see you soon.